the great thing about being a writer is that you don't actually have to know how to talk to crowds of people. So we'll see how this goes, but let me tell you, it's such an honor to be introduced by Hollis, who I love dearly and consider an actual, real life, not only internet-based, but like, meet space friend, and I adore her. So I'm here to talk about abortion, and I'm gonna start by actually talking about the abortion that I didn't have. I have been a single mother since I was 20. I was 19 when I was pregnant with my son. And if any of you follow my work, you know how much my children mean to me and how much they have shaped me as a person. I packed my son up. I left an abusive relationship, packed my son up, went off to finish my degree. He graduated from kindergarten the day before I got my bachelor's. About six months before I graduated, I found out I was pregnant with a second person. <laughs> and to say that the timing was off, <laughs> six months from graduating, you're already a single parent, and I was not exactly in a relationship that I knew was going to last. And I was scared. And in all honesty, here in liberal Seattle, the, ad the advice I was given time and time again was, oh my God, you cannot continue with this pregnancy. And I thought about it and I was so stressed out, I didn't know what to do. And I walked down, I mean, I had no money. I, th that year I, I looked at my tax returns, I made $16,000 that year. <laughs> so I had no car, no transportation. I walked down to the nearest Planned Parenthood um, and just sat there and I cried for the first time, let people know how scared I was. And uh, the woman there stopped and she put her hand over mine and she said, you are a smart, capable, and accomplished woman. Whatever you decide will be the best for you. It will be best for the child that you have. It will be the best for everyone involved. You know what you need for yourself. And that was the first time in my life as a woman that someone had told me that I had control and I knew what was best for my body and my future. The decision that I made was the best for me. And you guys have seen pictures of my lovely little weirdo science nerd who <laughs> runs around making uh, electrical diagrams all day at the age of eight. Um, and what choice I made is actually irrelevant to this story. The choice that I was given is a choice that so many other people are not given. It's, so many other women are not given this. So many people of color are not given this. So many trans and gender queer people are not given these options. I want us all to recognize today the huge amount of privilege we have to be in this room to be able to shout our abortions. I want us to recognize that as a woman of color, I come from a long legacy of women who were told that they could not only choose when and if they became pregnant, but they could not choose whether or not they kept their children women who were either forced to give up pregnancies they wanted, forced to keep pregnancies they did not want, women who have been forcibly sterilized well into the 90s. This has been going on. I want us to recognize that for trans people, the question of reproductive rights is even more fraught and can actually endanger them when they try to take control over whether or not they are ready to have a child. So to be sitting here and shouting our abortion, we need to understand that we are already three steps ahead of where so many other people would love to be able to be.
it is important that we reduce stigma. It is important that we reduce stigma not only around abortion, but around all of our contraceptive and reproductive choices. We also need to remember that abortion rights are not rights if they do not come with access. We must remember that the struggle against abortion is first and foremost class warfare against the underprivileged. Those of means are not worried about how they will be able to control their reproductive choices. What they want to do is make sure that we do not have the means to control when and where we reproduce and how we plan our lives. They want to make sure that we are as beholden to them as possible. Do not forget that, that any effort that does not include equal and affordable access to all reproductive choices is not reproductive justice. And when we have doctors and clinics who do not listen to women of color when they say that their current contraception does not work for them, we do not have reproductive justice. When we do not have doctors who are not sensitive to the needs of trans people to make sure they are working with them with contraception that they can live with, we do not have reproductive justice. I am really happy to be here today and see so many people I think that we need to remember that this is bigger than us, and it's bigger than our little corner of the world. We need to remember the reproductive rights of people from different walks of life, from different income situations, different racial situations. We need to remember, too, that part of your reproductive rights means the ability to watch your child grow up, and when one in three black men will see prison in his life, That is also an issue. We can do this together. If we work to support the most disenfranchised among us, if we start there, I am so tired of starting with the most privileged first. We cannot have trickle-down reproductive justice. It does not work. If we work to meet the needs of those who need it the most, if we work to meet the needs of those most disenfranchised by our movements, everyone will do better. So I'm going to just leave you with this bit. I hope that you consider how important economic justice is to reproductive justice. Because having a bunch of options is wonderful, but if you don't have the financial stability to be able to make those choices that would otherwise be best for you, that is not reproductive justice, right? We need to understand how important criminal justice is to this. To keep our mothers and our fathers with the children that they would love to have. To make sure that women who become pregnant and are incarcerated have their rights as well. We can do this. 
and we can do it together. And I'm hearing these conversations shift, I'm hearing them change, and I think that this is a huge part of it, being able to come here and bring these things up. There are very few venues where I would be able to stand up and talk about this and have a receptive audience, and I am incredibly grateful for this. I want to thank Amelia for putting this together. I want to thank her too for the time and care that she put forth to make sure that this was an intersectional event, to make sure that I wasn't staring out in a room full of purely cis, white, straight people like I am so often. And I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. And I want to thank you for what I am choosing to trust will be your future efforts in looking at the entire picture of reproductive justice and what that looks for people of all walks of life. Okay. I don't really have anything else to say about that. <laughs> <laughs>